going to talk about predictably agile. Um, so um, before we kind of get into it, just a little bit about myself, if you don't know. So I, um, as, I, as I'm one of the organisers of Lean Agile Brighton. Um, I work for a company called Tech Systems Global Services. Um, I lead our agile practice in uh, the UK and Europe. Um, and yeah, I've been kind of in the agile in the agile circles for 20 over 20, 20 odd years now. Um, so I uh, like to kind of do quite a bit of conference speaking um, and kind of I, I use it as my way of kind of playing around and testing with ideas. Um, so this is a kind of fairly new talk. Uh, so this will be the second time I've given this one. So hopefully it's uh, it, it won't be completely rough and ready. Um, but uh, yeah, still still kind of learning on, on how this one goes. So um, and also it, it's it, it's about some kind of ideas and thinking that's kind of fairly new for me as well. Um, so it's a good way of me. I find that this is a good way of me of getting my my head around a topic and, and getting my thinking straight on it. Um, so uh, looking for kind of interesting feedback as well on, uh, on on what you think of it as well. Um, before we get into what I mean by predictably agile, I'd like to start off with and I'm going to just change the screen share. I'm going to start off with a, uh, a menti poll. So if you go to menti.com uh, and use the code 26465047, or if you've got a mobile, you should be able to just scan that QR code to take you straight there. Uh, I'm going to, when I slip, flip this kind of slide onto the next one, uh, you're going to get a question um, about what predictably agile means to you. Um, and when I use that phrase, what, what comes to mind? So I'll, I'll just leave this up just to give people a chance to uh, get into Menti, scan the QR code if you want to. Um, and then I'll, uh, I'll flip over. So I'm going to go now. So the, if you're not quite got in there, the code is at the top anyway, so um, you can still get in, in there. So what comes to mind when you hear the phrase predictably agile? Uh, and partic particularly, you know, what kind of predictability? So what does predictability mean to you? Uh, put your answer in and it should start scrolling up as, as the answers come in, should start scrolling up on the screen. If it's not working for any, oh, okay, here we go. So confidence levels, yeah, delivering on promises. Team velocity, safe, uh, okay. No surprises. Cool, yeah, so I think I think all of these, hopefully I should be able to uh, touch on in some way. Um, so uh, we're on the same page in, in, I think, what we mean by predictability. Uh, okay, I think that, that looks like it. All right, so I'm gonna, uh, Flip back to the slides again, and then uh, let's talk through what I mean by predictably agile. So what did I have in mind when I pick that title? We've done the menti. Um, so when I go into organisations uh, and we start talking about agile transformation, and they're asking for coaching or asking for some sort of help, typically I'll start asking questions around what do they mean by transformation? You know, why do they want to go a transform through a transformation? Um, and that usually ends up coming down to um, one or all of, of these six things. Um, so to be successful, do they need to deliver more value? Do they need to be more productive? Do they want to be more predictable? Do they want to be more responsive? Do they want to improve quality or do they want to improve their sustainability? Um, and it's usually multiple of those things. So it's, it's not necessarily one, um, but just, just talking about these six things, um, will will trigger different conversations and surface different information. Um, so what do I mean by those six? Um, so um, by responsiveness, how quickly can we deliver work? Uh, and we can typically measure that in lead time. So that's a nice easy one to say, we can tell you if you're being more responsive. Sustainability is about being able to continue to deliver work in the long term. So not just, you know, short term um, 
big you know short-term focuses and and you know working weekends and things to deliver stuff but being able to do that so we can look at that sometimes in terms of our code base and our architecture and maybe use some static code analysis sometimes we we can look at that in terms of our employee satisfaction employee engagement and our, our people happy do we are our developers do we have a good developer experience so i think there are ways we can measure that value are we, are we delivering the right work um, I mean, we can we could just look at you know business business results, financials. We could look at customer satisfaction, um, some of those things. So there's some ways we can deliver a value or measure value, quality. Uh, we can measure as, as oh, is the work being delivered in the right way. So um, we can look at um, escape defects or um, customer support requests. Um, or maybe even customer satisfaction, a different way of looking at kind of customer satisfaction. So I think there are some ways we can deliver and measure quality. Productivity is, is um, how much work are we delivering? So can we deliver work in quantity? Uh, the fairly standard one there is measuring throughput. So how much work are we delivering over a period of time? And then predictability, I think, of is, is work being delivered consistently and reliably? Um, I've never come up with a good way of, of measuring that. Um, or certainly not a good um, objective way of doing it. You can kind of ask questions and do some subjective stuff, um, but I've never found a good objective way. Um, so I've been playing around with that for this talk. So this is focusing on, on the predictability of these six. Um, but uh, I guess a, a, a warning is, uh, is not to just focus on predictability. And that's, you know, that's not the goal here. It's just, you know, of, of these six, this is the one that's kind of got me thinking and got me interested recently. Um, but we need to make sure we're maintaining a balance across these things because we could be more predictable but by just kind of committing to less and doing work um, in a kind of slower pace, which would make us less responsive and less productive, for example. So what do we mean by predictability? I kind of went and looked at the uh, at dictionary definition. Um, two definitions here. I think the one that's more relevant is the top one. Um, so being able to, able to be known, seen or declared in advance. So that's that idea of when we make a plan, can we know, see, declare in advance of what we're going to deliver by a certain date? Um, so that's typically what I think when I'm kind of talking to execs or leaders around how predictable the business are, they want to know and have more confidence in advance of, of what work they're going to get and when they're going to get it. Um, I think the second definition is interesting in terms of behaving in a way that's expected. Um, I've worked with lots of teams that by that definition are highly predictable. Um, and they're highly predictable because they usually massively overcommit for a sprint and then massively under deliver. Uh, and I, you know, however much you point this out, they do it sprint on sprint on sprint. So arguably that's predictable, um, not necessarily a, a useful form of predictability. So I'm more interested in how do we help organizations have more idea around what they're gonna get and when they're gonna get it um, so they can make some sort of longer term plans while still being agile. Obviously we don't wanna kind of go back to trying to do this by by being waterfall and doing lots of upfront detail. So a lot of the, the things I'm going to talk through here are, are hypotheses. So uh, these are these are thoughts, ideas, experiments that I've I've either been running or, or are wanting to run. Um, and my hope here is that this this is inspire some ideas where maybe you go off and run your own experiments. So uh, the more people run some experiments like this, the more feedback, the more learning we'll get about whether this this is a useful thing to be doing, whether some of these ideas are useful. So um, that's why I'm, I'm kind of putting this out there maybe before I've kind of proven it is because it's a hypothesis and I'd love more people to be kind of thinking about this and testing it. So the first thing uh, to talk about is, is say do measures. So this is probably the most common form of metric I see when we talk about predictability. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to kind of caveat all this with a big warning. I don't necessarily like say do metrics. They're not necessarily you know, a crime. This is probably uh, exaggerating things slightly, um, but definitely kind of word of caution about using some of these things. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of talk about what I mean by a say do metric, some examples, and then, and then say why. The first one is, is the idea of velocity predictability. Um, so this is this is what a lot of scrum teams do. Um, how much work do you plan into the sprint, uh, and how much work do you actually deliver in the sprint? So this screenshot um, comes from is your DevOps. Um, so you can see the bar graphs of of 
work planned, work completed, work completed late, and, and work that's that's not yet been completed. Um, I'd say I, this one is is slightly better because you'll see at the top, you know, they're defining velocity here actually by count of work items rather than story points. You can you can switch between the two. So to me, that makes it slightly uh, more useful or more relevant. Um, but but a lot of the time we're we're doing defining velocity by story points, so number of story points planned. So really, what we're doing there is is taking a, particularly story points. Story points are kind of a, a fairly arbitrary number. Uh, we're kind of trying to trying to forecast an arbitrary number over over a sprint, which might be a, an arbitrary period of time. Um, and it, I find it it just doesn't become useful um, or doesn't become meaningful. Um, so it can be useful where where you know where you see these teams that massively overcommit and then massively underdeliver. This can you know this is a useful way of helping those teams see that. Um, maybe it makes them more predictable. Like my, I'd argue that it makes them more reliable. They can more reliably deliver what they're planning to. I don't necessarily think that it helps the business be more predictable. So um, probably kind of an, an element of context there. Um, but I think there are better ways of doing that, you know, even at the team level. Um, the other one, so somebody mentioned SAFE in the mentee earlier. SAFE has this idea of program predictability. Um, so well, this one might need I mean, describing in a little bit more detail. So SAFE has program increments. Program increment is a, is a kind of a, a period of time, which is usually a number of sprints. Um, and then for that program increment, which, you know, it's normally kind of around about a quarter. Um, you define your objectives for the sprint. So the, the, the plus point here is that you're there doing this in terms of objectives, which are more outcome focused rather than, you know, just the, the what are you delivering? So it's, it's outcome rather than output focused. So that's a, that's kind of a, a tick in the box for it. But then they take the you take these objectives and you score them from one to 10 on how much business value that is. So we're now kind of into the realms of, of kind of making up numbers for, for objectives. Um, so you kind of figure out how much business value have we planned, and then you get to the end of the, the PI and you ask the business, well, how much business value did we deliver? So how well, you know, how much of that value for those objectives did we deliver? So you can see here, um, the first one was scored seven out of 10 and the business went, um, yeah, you scored seven out of 10. Now what's interesting with the safe is that you can never deliver more value than you said you were going to do. So you can't say, oh, we thought this is going to be a seven, you scored an eight. Seems uh, that seems a bit of an odd thing. I, know, I, I guess there's nothing stopping you, but you know, technically safe by the by the safe by the book says you know you can't deliver more value than you plan to do. Um, this third one down, we thought we were going to do eight business value points. We actually delivered six, um, and then you you'll notice this this kind of bar goes down, and you can't see it in this screenshot. But there's the idea of uncommitted objectives. You might deliver uncommitted objectives which have value. Um, and therefore, you can actually deliver more than 100% value. So your, your safe program predictability is a percentage of actual value to planned value. Um, and then we, we kind of score that over the PIs and the idea being that you should be in this sweet spot of 80 to 100%. Um, if you're below 80%, you're, you're not predictable. Um, we're not targeting 100% because you don't necessarily want to try to be perfectly predictable. Um, but you can deliver more than 100%. So um, again, it's similar to, to velocity predictability, you know, might be useful for um, safe release trains, value streams that just can't, you know, have no idea about what their capacity is and they don't really know how much to work to plan in and, and are not very good at delivering anything. Um, can give you some visibility to that. Does it really give you the business some predictability of what they're going to get and when they're going to get it? I, I don't think it does. Um, so again, I would call this, you know, program reliability, maybe more than uh, program predictability. So the main, my main problem with, with those two forms are that it kind of seems to be creating magic numbers. So I kind of found this, this cartoon to try and kind of describe what I'm, what I'm, what I have a problem with is we can, we can use velocity. We can use these, this idea of, of business objectives and scoring value gains those, but we're really just kind of making up numbers and then reassuring ourselves with those numbers that those numbers kind of look good and to try and make the point that we're predictable. But I don't think they really represent predictability. They just kind of make us feel good. But as I said, they could be, could be useful feedback for teams that are going to really need it. 
um, but that's more around reliability than predictability. So that's that's say do metrics. Um, so what's oh, a better alternative? Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Like, um, can you distinguish for me the difference between reliability and predictability to you? I, I'm not yeah. Sure. So. So predictability, and I, I guess I'm using reliability just to make a difference if I kind of go back to the dictionary definition back here. I'm using reliability more around this second to, to differentiate between these two definitions. So a, a team that's reliable, I think reliably delivers what it says it's going to, you know, can be relied on to deliver the right work. Um, if you're reliable, you're probably predictable, but uh, to me, they're they're subtly different things. Um, so you have to have reliability to, in order to be predictable. You could be reliable, but still not be predictable because yeah, you could yeah, reliably yeah. deliver things, something in the short term, but does that allow you to predict what you can deliver in the longer term? Mm, okay. So reliability, I guess for me is more behavioral, mm -hmm. whereas predictability is more around forecasting and planning. Mm. So that may okay. help. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I suppose in a slightly different context, you can be maybe a reliable person because you, you're you punctual or something like that, but unpredictable in the way that you respond to certain scenarios, maybe. Yes. Yeah. So you could be, yeah, or maybe you're, you're reliable in that you, you can be relied on to turn up to a meeting in time. Yeah but we don't know which meetings you're going to turn up to. Okay, yeah. That might be, that might be stretching the metaphor. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Um, okay. Thanks for the question though. Um, so, so looking at trying to, trying to find a, a better way. Um, so that got me into looking into, to lead time variation as a way of understanding predictability. So first off is, so we're looking at kind of getting into st statistical process control here. Um, and I had a, had a bit of a, an, uh, a discussion with Dan Vacanti about this, um, and, and he takes the, the Deming view, which is, um, well, this is, the, the, this is kind of Deming's quote. So a process that is not in statistical control has not a defining capability, its performance is not predictable. So, so Deming's view is that a system is predictable or it's not predictable. So it's kind of black and white. So you're either in statistical control, in which case we understand the capability of the system and therefore we can predict or it's not in statistical control we don't understand the capability and we can't predict so if it's black and white then the the the, the kind of the notion of improving predictability becomes questionable because you either are or you're not um, so i think you know i'm i'm not going to argue with deming um, so i was kind of thinking well well what why do i have this kind of different take on this and i think actually what, what I mean by improving predictability and what most businesses mean by when they say we want to be more predictable, I think they mean we want our predictions to be more useful. Um, so I'll, and I'll, I'll kind of describe what I mean by that with, with some examples. So we can look at um, lead time uh, run charts. So this, this is using a tool called Actionable Agile. Um, so actually we mentioned Julia Wester earlier. Um, this is, this is Julia's company's tool, um, or, you know, Julia's, Julia's company um, develops this tool. Um, and it looks, each of these dots represents a piece of work and where it is horizontally represents the date that piece of work was finished. So it got moved into a done state. We can say it was done. And where it is vertically represents how long that piece of work took to complete. So the elapsed time between starting that piece of work and finishing that piece of work, and that's the lead time. So we can see this pattern of dots of all the work that was finished and how long all that work took. And then we can take that data as a population. And what we're seeing here is that 85% of the work was completed in 16 days or less. So what that means is 85% of these dots are below this dotted line where this dotted line represents a 16 day uh, lead time, cycle, sorry, cycle time. Oh, I, should, I should use cycle time because that's what the tool uses. Um, um, so if we have a stable system, then what that means is we can, should be able to predict that we have an 85% probability of delivering a new piece of work in 16 days. So arguably that's, that's our level of predictability. And that's that notion of we're predictable or we're not. We can predict that um, it takes 16 days to deliver 
work with an 85% probability. The other number on here, or the other thing we can take from this is that there's a 20% chance of work completed being completed in two days or less. And what that means is the you know, 20% of these dots are at the two day or less mark. So there's a gap between that two day and 16 day. So what that really is kind of saying is there's a 65% chance of work being completed between two and 16 days. Um, these, the 85% and the 20% are kind of arbitrary. 85% is a kind of fairly standard, you know, and what's kind of usually perceived to be a, you know, a reasonable confidence interval. So we don't necessarily, if we, if we want 100% confidence, um, that's, you know, it's just too risk averse. Uh, if we're down at taking a 50% confidence interval, um, which would be down like a 10 days, maybe that's um, too risky. So the right amount of risk is roughly 85%. Um, I would normally have kind of gone for 15% down here just to kind of make it nice and uh, to match and symmetrical. Um, but the data wouldn't give me a 50, the, the tool would, you know, with this data set only gave me a 20%. I, it, I don't think it, it makes a huge difference. Um, as long as you're you're being consistent, um, so 65% chance of work being completed between two and 16 days. So, when a business wants to know when a piece of work is being done, yes, they want to know what's the kind of the last date it's going to be delivered. But sometimes they might want to know when the soonest it's going to be delivered is. Because if we're looking to make, you know, say we're looking to making a marketing plan, um, if we and plan our marketing around 16 days and then this thing ends up getting delivered in two days we might be equally frustrated as it being delivered early as it being delivered late now two and 16 days probably not a huge huge difference but imagine this was two days and 160 days imagine our 85 percent confidence interval was 160 days and now saying you might get it in two days you might get it in 160 days that's quite a big gap so yes, the system is predictable, but is that predictability useful to the business? I don't think it is. So that's why I'm kind of thinking around what we mean by predictability is the usefulness of our ability to, of the predictions that we make. So what does it mean then to increase that usefulness? I think it's about trying to close this gap. So I took this data set, played around with it a little bit and basically reduced the lead time of everything. So it kind of morphs a bit. And now we've got our 85 percentile interval being at eight days or less, because I've kind of said everything takes half the time. And our 20 percent interval is now down at one day. So now the 65 percent chance of work being completed be one in eight days. So we've now got an eight day gap instead of a 15, a 14 day gap. Um, so my, my hypothesis, my argument, is that the narrower the gaps that kind of the, that the, the narrow the, the variability of our cycle time or lead time the more predictable the system is whereby more predictable i really mean the more useful the predictability is so that's my hypothesis um, which then got me thinking around well how would you put some numbers on that that we might be able to measure it and track it and demonstrate that over time as a business, we are being more predictable. Um, so we've got, you know, cycle time is our measure of responsiveness and that effectively that 85 percentile gives us a measure of how responsive we are as a business. Th our throughput is the number of things we're delivering. And we, again, we can, we can kind of go 85% of the time we deliver this many items per month. Um, what does it mean to, to, to use a similar number for predictability? So couple of hypotheses I played around with. One is, is, is the idea of cycle time inequality. Um, so this is building on the idea of uh, income inequality, which is a kind of fairly standard way of, of looking at the differences between you know, the, the incomes of the poorest people and the richest people. So they use a P90 to P10 ratio. Again, the actual P being the percentiles, the actual percentiles don't matter, but it's say, taking an upper band value uh, and comparing it to the um, the lower band value. So the ninth decile, that's the 90th percentile, down to the first decile, that's the 10th percentile. And the higher that ratio, the less equality there is. So if 10% are earning lots and lots and lots, and the bottom 10% are earning nothing, 
that's a big gap, that's lots of inequality. So basically what we're saying there is to use that, we can say for that data set one, we're gonna use 85 and 20 instead of 90 and 10, um, but our P85 is 16, our P20 is 10, so our cycle time inequality is eight. Okay, I just realized I forgot to warn people that there's maths involved in this talk. So apologies if, if, if you know, you'd have left 15 minutes ago if you'd known that. Um, I'll try and keep the math simple. I'm not a mathematician, so um, I'm, I'm trying to keep this as simple and, and as clear as possible. But that's, so that's, that's the, the numbers that we would use from data set one. So Sorry, data Carl, set two, yeah. Just check that one on the left, should that be 14? Just checking, I'm getting my head around this. Uh, should what be 14? Cycle time inequality. So uh, no, six, six, no, 16 divided by two. Divided, it's sorry. The, it's the ratio. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. It's the ratio. P, no, it's the P85 divided by the P20. Got it. Thanks. Uh, but, but, you know, poten potentially come back to that one. Okay. Um, uh, so the data set two, our P85 was eight. Our P20 was one, which means our cycle time inequality is eight. Uh, it's exactly the same. So I kind of disproved my hypothesis by actually just plugging some numbers in and looking at some data. Um, um, but yeah, what, what's interesting, actually, no, I'll, I'll come back to that point around, you know, why don't you just subtract one from the other? Because um, that might be a better way of doing it, it turns out. Hypothesis two is to use an ideal, basically use the cycle time coefficient of variation. So um, there's the, you know, the, the mathematical definition of the coefficient of variation there. Um, but it's basically, you know, the, the variation of, a, of the data around the mean. Um, so this is the one you're just going to have to trust me on the numbers. Uh, um, and, and if you're a mathematician and, and uh, I've got these numbers wrong, please tell me. But um, standard deviation is 7.33. The mean is 9.37. So our cycle time coefficient of variation is 0 0.78. Um, you, can, you can calculate this in Excel if you, if you really need to. Data set two, our standard deviation is 3.96, um, lower because things are more compressed together. Our mean is 4.89. Uh, so our cycle time coefficient of variation is 0 0.76. So not exactly the same. And I think that's because some rounding as I was kind of halving some of those cycle times, but it's basically the same. So again, just disprove my hypothesis by plugging some numbers in. Um, so, um, this this one, I, hypothesis one, I kind of as soon as it, as soon as I kind of plug the numbers in, it's like, oh, should have should have guessed that. That should have been fairly obvious. This one, I had to scratch my head around. Um, but again, it's because the mean has dropped as well as the the deviation. Therefore, the coefficient of variation basically remains the same. Um, so, um, all that these two these two ways of measuring it turn out not to be good ways. Um, turns out, you know, potentially. To go back to, to Ben's point, a simple way of doing it might be just to look at the difference. You know, 16 minus 2 is 14 versus 8 minus 1 is 7. So uh, arguably, I was just trying to be way too clever. Uh, and this just turns out that, that might be a much simpler way of doing it. Um, but it, it did then get me thinking, well, uh, you know, maybe maybe there's other even better ways. So kind of go, going off and, and, and talking to people around this, um, I started thinking around, well, instead of just looking at predictability itself what might be leading indicators of predictability that are that could be useful for us to measure instead um, so what do i mean by kind of leading indicators this is the idea of leading and lagging measures so uh, and i've taken these definitions from um for disciplines of execution which i just i just think they they kind of nail it really well with their definitions um, so the lagging measure is is the, what they what for disciplines execution calls the wildly important goal. So they're the things we, you know, we're really interested, the ones we spend the most time praying over. But so in this sense, predictability is our lagging measure. So we want to improve our predictability. We need to do stuff to improve predictability, but until we've done it, we won't know whether we have improved predictability. So predictability is the lagging measure of whether the things were the changes we're making is having an effect. The lead measures, um, are the things that we do, the high impact things we can do in order to reach that goal. So what are the things that we can do that we can measure that are the lead measures, which we predict, and this is how they decide it, they're predictive of achieving the goal. We predict will improve predictability um, and that can we can influence. So we can do something about to improve predictability. So looking at that from that lens, um, 
that kind of gets me thinking around, well, actually what we're trying to do is reduce cycle time. So what are the things that are going to indicate that cycle time is getting a, getting long before we have finished it? So effectively, we're looking at reducing work in process uh, and aging work in progress. So what we want to do is make these, you know, this is an outlier. This is the thing that's taken, you know, over 40 days. We want to make the cycle time of these things shorter. What we don't want to do is to make these things that are going through really quickly, this one that's taken a, don a, a long time, we don't want to narrow this variability by making this one take longer. So what are the things that we can do to make to make sure that we're reducing the cycle time of the items which take a long time? And, and from a kind of stable system perspective, they're probably things that are, that are creating noise and, and effectively that's therefore making the system potentially unpredictable. So really what we're doing is looking at aging whip. So no, rather than waiting till an item has been done and it's no longer in process before looking at its cycle time, let's look at its cycle time as it increases while we're still working on it um, and try and identify when that work in process is uh, the, the, that work in process. So this, the, the aging of that work in process um, is showing that it's going to take longer than it should. So there's this aging work in process chart. Again, this is from Actionable Agile, um, Julia West's company. Um, and built on exactly the same data set, that, that kind of first data set. So you can see when things get to done, you've got the 85 percentile line at 16 days. But what this does is it, it also tracks work through the life cycle. So we can say, actually, 85 percent of work gets into testing in 14 days. 85 percent of work gets into dev done in 13 days. 85% of work is in dev active in 10 days and 85% of work is in analysis done in five days. So we can look at how long work takes in each of our steps in the process. Um, and then you, you've kind of got this color banding for the different percentiles. So this, this orange one is here is showing that, that band of work that is between the 85 and 95 percentile. This uh, yellowy one here is, is the, the, the work that takes between 70% and 85%. So, so while stuff's in, you know, the green and yellow, it's probably okay. It's probably flowing through the system in a way we would expect. As soon as work goes into the orange band, that means it's it's already older than we would expect it to be, even though we've not finished it yet. So there's there's this dot here. And so the three in the dot just actually just means this 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 dot represents three separate pieces of work. These items already have more than an 85% probability of taking longer than 16 days. So even though they're all it looks like they're, you know, they're 11 days old at the moment, at 11 days, we would expect them to be in dev active and they're not. So we can, based on our data, we can say they're probably already late. And now that means we can start doing something about that. We can start looking and understanding why are these things late? Are they blocked? Um, are they stuck? Um, is there, you know, if, if they've been forgotten about, you know, what, what is it about these things? Do we need to swarm on them to get them back on track? So they kind of, we get them back from the orange band back into the yellow and green bands, which means we can be more proactive about looking and managing our cycle time. Which effectively means we can look at our, our whip age. So this is a, a dashboard from an actionable agile again, which is kind of looking at the stability of the system and looking at the average whip age um, over the previous periods of time. So, um, so today our average whip age of the working process is 11.03. So, so it's 11, 11 days, just over 11 days. Last week it was 9.89 days. Last month it was 5.37 days. So we can see that our average whip age is getting longer. Therefore, we can probably say that our system is becoming less predictable the variability of our lead time is going to be going up. Therefore, the usefulness of our predictions is going to be less. We're going to have a higher band, higher kind of distribution from the quick items to the slower items because we've got more items taking longer. So that's one way of maybe looking at using average work in process age as a leading indicator of predictability. But then we can take that uh, another step further and kind of go, well, what is it that usually causes work in process to become old, to age, and typically it's because work gets blocked. So what if we look and start capturing data around blockers and the number of blockers 
that were raising the number of blockers that were resolving um, and what that, you know, what the net number of blockers is. So are we, are we raising more blockers than we're resolving? Are we resolving more than we're raising? Um, and what's, you know, potentially what's our average number of blockers over a period of time? So getting good data about our blockers, and you can see here, again, this is just some example data, and this is from an app, so blockedapp.com from a, um, Troy McGinnis, if you know Troy. Um, he's, he's charting the number of blockers that are currently open, blockers in progress, and also just looking at how old those blockers are. So we've got a bunch of blockers here that have been blocked for more than 30 days. How many were resolving? And we can see over time, we're starting to resolve blockers, more blockers than we're raising, um, and those, some of those really old blockers are, are starting to get resolved as well. So if we manage and get some data around blockers, number of blockers we're raising, resolving, and the age of those blockers, the average age of those blockers, again, if we have fewer blockers that are um, less aged, we think that that will make us more predictable. So that's kind of the other way of thinking about this. And does blockers become a useful metric to effectively measure our predictability? So coming to that, um, just trying to kind of wrap this up a little bit. Um, this is kind of my hypothesis. We, we want, by, by predictability, we want to be able to produce useful plans and forecasts. So the business is able to know, see, declare in advance what work it's going to get and when it's going to get it. Um, this is my current hypothesis. So kind of going back using that hypothesis template, I believe measuring blockers will result in less aged work in process. That'll result in fewer long lead time work items. That's going to make the system more consistent. Um, and by consistent, I mean the lead time will have a lower variability. Um, and that's going to make the predictability of the system more useful. Um, so I've, this is, I've not tested this yet. This is kind of my next set of experiments and things I want to play around with. Um, but um, I probably, you know, to do this, you need to have some more subjective conversation with stakeholders around, well, do they have more confidence in plans and forecasts? Are, is the predictability of the system becoming more useful? You know, that's probably a way of testing whether this hypothesis is correct or not. So I'm kind of hoping that um, people uh, will take some of these ideas, play around with them, try and test this hypothesis themselves. Um, you know, maybe somebody's already doing this, in which case I'd love to hear from you and find out more about, you know, what you've learned. Um, I'm going to flip back to Mentimeter because I'm kind of, this is my, my quick way then of getting some immediate feedback. So I'm kind of curious as to... Uh, Given those kind of ideas I've just presented, you know, how do you feel about measuring predictability? Um, do you think it's a terrible idea? Are you curious to learn more about it and maybe try some of these things? Or are you kind of fully convinced and you just you just think everybody should be trying and doing this? Uh, so I'll uh, I'll leave the results hidden and just wait till we've kind of good set of results. Don't want people to be biasing each other, copying each other's answers. So I think we had around 14 or 15 people do the mentee the first to the start of the talk, this talk. So let's give it a little bit longer. All right, we're to 15. All right, so let's show the results. Okay. Oh, wow. That's, that's good. That's good. So nobody thinks it's a terrible idea. Good. Hope you're not just being polite. Feel free to tell me if you think it's a terrible idea. Um, uh, I, I kind of, kind of quite like that. You think everybody should be doing this. So, um, given that, uh, a lot of this is just hypothesis and, uh, a thought experiment at the moment. Um, so yeah, if, if you want to go off and try this, you know, please let me know, please, uh, um, give me some feedback, uh, or, you know, go off, start doing your own conference talks around, uh, what you've done and what you learned, uh, what works, what doesn't work. Um, so just to, just to wrap up then, uh, I guess this is just just making sure that people don't don't go away with the wrong idea. By predictability, you know, one is that idea of predictability is just one of six those potential outcomes. So you want to be measuring those other things as well. 
so that you don't over focus on just becoming predictability. But let's also remember Bill, the, that, you know, we're not saying there should be no deviation. So a couple of nice little quotes here. One, Frank Zappo, you know, without deviation from the norm, progress is not possible. So we're doing knowledge work. We're doing kind of creative work. We don't want every work item to be taken exactly the same period of time because that's, you know, we're not, we're not in manufacturing here. Um, but within a certain amount of deviation, I think there's a little level of predictability that we can have. And then, you know, deviation from the norm would be punished unless it's exploitable. Um, just a different way, kind of the same thing is deviation can be beneficial. So where you do have these, you know, outliers, the things take a long time, uh, you know, maybe there's something to learn from that. Um, and, and maybe there's something you can exploit from that, either in terms of learning to improve your system um, or learning something about, you know, your products and your, your, your processes. Mm -hmm.